Nine North is jumping into the community conversation on timely subject matter that's been magnified because of the pandemic. Throughout 2021, we will be hosting a series of listening sessions about controversial topics that impact your community. We have titled this series Compass Programs, and today's segment is The Expanding News Desert When Local Newspapers Disappear. A little bit of a long title, but we want to focus on one particular part of it. And our first panelist is Mike Munzenreiter, who is currently the associate editor of Fender Bender, where he oversees the publication's content. He served at Lilly News as the executive editor for five years and covered many of our northern suburbs. And next, we're going to meet Margot Ashmore, who's publisher of the Northeaster. It's a community newspaper for Northeast Minneapolis, St. Anthony, Columbia Heights, and Hilltop. In her connections to the community, she also sits on the board of Northeast of Northeast Minneapolis Arts District and Art to Change the World. And also every spring and winter since 2005 until this pandemic, she's coordinated the Minneapolis and St. Paul Home Tour. And our third panelist is Zach Farber, a writer and editor with experience in both print and online journalism. He most recently served as the editor of the Southwest Journal, a free 30,000 circulation bi-weekly community newspaper that served 21 neighborhoods in Southwest Minneapolis. In 2020, the paper staff won eight awards with the Minnesota Society of Professional Journalists Page One Award Contest, more than any other newspaper in the state, any daily newspaper that is. So welcome to the three of you. Thank you for coming to our program. A um, lot of expertise here and I can't wait to hear what all you have to say. Let's just start out, you have each one of you introduce yourself a little bit and tell us about what you're doing now as far as newspapers go. In the same order as we it were doesn't introduced. Make a difference. Whoever wants to talk first. <laughs> right. uh, I think the intro that you gave us was just fine. <laughs> we're currently working on the edition that will come out on February 24th. Okay, so your newspaper is still active. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Margo. How about Zach? Yeah, so I was with the Southwest Journal and that paper closed in December after 30 years. Um, it was a, a family owned um, paper and sort of problems related to the pandemic um, and just sort of declining ad revenue in the industry um, forced the paper to close. And I'm currently looking for other opportunities. Okay, and Mike, you also worked for a family owned newspaper, correct? Yeah, correct. I was with Lily Suburban Newspapers for five and a half years, and uh, that was a 80 plus year family business based out of North St. Paul, had kind of a horseshoe around uh, of coverage around St. Paul and down into the South Metro, a dozen titles at various times. And uh, yeah, it shut down in September 2019 for not pandemic re related reasons, but a lot of the same reasons that Zach brought up, you know, changes in advertising. Okay. Well, and we know Lily covered a lot of our Northern suburban cities here too. So they are missed a lot. <laughs> so, um, and let's start talking about that. What happens when a newspaper goes away? We know that in half of the 3,143 counties that are in the country, they only have one newspaper. And it's usually a small weekly attempting to cover all of its various communities. Almost 200 counties in the country have no newspaper at all. Um, so, I'm asking you experts here, what are the immediate adverse effects and the loss, the long-term effects um, of single small papers taking on large areas like that? Let's start with Mike. Yeah, uh, my experience at Lilly, I showed up there in 2014 and there's maybe a dozen people in the newsroom. There were two editors that had no beat. You know, they were strictly editing, managing. So that makes for 10 reporters for, you know, numerous titles. By the time it was all over, there were five reporters. I was an executive editor, but I was also covering a beat that included Roseville and Little Canada and, you know, two other cities. Uh, you get reporters trying to cover a lot more ground and thus you get fewer stories, uh, less depth. And that's just a fact. It's, you know, there's only so much ground people can cover. I also saw, um, you know, a loss of coverage of areas 
outside of hard news, you know, we used to do high school sports and that was really a bread and butter type of coverage area that a lot of people turned to. But as, you know, things started to get tighter, the sports reporter was a first cut and um, they're all tough business decisions. And, you know, it's hard to say what you have to value the most, but I think you just see a decline in overall coverage and overall information about communities and uh, trying to cover, you know, the sports beat a little bit myself while, while I was also doing city hall, you know, sports and all of it, but sports in general, or specifically, I should say, you know, it takes just time and you got to cultivate people and uh, you, you just lose so much. So, Margo, you have a number of uh, communities that you are covering, a number of municipalities again, too. Um, How does that work, having a small paper be able to use all of that kind of information in a way that helps those residents? Well, we take a different approach. Rather than play-by-play coverage of, you know, whether it's meetings or sports, we try to look for things that are in common, you know, like we'll take a a social issues topic and see what each of the cities are doing um, relating to that. And um, I, I, I'm glad to hear from some folks have said, even though I don't live in your community, I always find something interesting in your paper. (laughs) And, and yet we're not really trying to be a global, you know, we are trying to be fiercely local. And yet, I guess this kind of solutions approach or, um, you know, bigger picture approach, we've just, I guess, given ourselves permission to do that rather than being on that hamster wheel, you know, with a lot of the thinking that we're doing around, you know, preparing for this show. I, I'm thinking, wow, yeah, there's a lot of people that are really just running on a hamster wheel and they think the solution is to run faster and faster. Well, you know. <laughs> City newsletters and social media are taking on a lot of those uh, functions that perhaps those suburban newspapers used to fill um, with the hard news. And so we maybe actually, you know, have have more time. I hate to say that we actually do have more time because we don't, but <laughs> we've at least, you know, taken that approach of um, of of taking a longer view or taking a different view or, um, you know, trying to find different things in common and again, to find solutions uh, perhaps that are being um, modeled in other cities. And, uh, you know, they might might not be a perfect fit, but uh, it could be something that would would spark um, community members to start thinking a little differently about, about the problem. So, Zach, you had a little bit of a different view in that you were covering neighborhoods, um, which are certainly communities of their own. Um, Can you tell us what it was like to cover a lot of different um, areas of the city? Yeah, I I think that the Southwest Journal was definitely similar to the Northeaster in in a lot of ways that we sort of covered the different communities, but we also tried to give a citywide look um, for for, for our readers. Um, when, When I started, the paper was down in the number of reporters um, to two full-time reporters where uh, a few years prior they had had um, quite, a, quite a few, few more. Um, so it was really just trying to figure out how to focus um, the, the two reporters' energy. And we spent, we, we sort of cut down on citywide coverage out of the, the feeling that the Star Tribune and the TV stations would be doing more of that. And we really focused on on neighborhood stories and sort of development stuff. And then we, we um, and, uh, and public safety, and then we really had a couple of big beats um, in terms of schools and the park board. So we were really doing the most comprehensive coverage of of those two areas. You know, but my first job in journalism was for the website Patch, uh, which in the early 2010s had a few dozen local news sites and communities across the Twin Cities, including one in Roseville. And when I started there, each town had an editor who wrote their own articles and worked with freelancers and staff. Um, and it was kind of s- similar to Mike's experience um, that eventually um, Patch was owned by AOL and funded by venture capital and it sort of ran out of money. Um, and we really had to force, we were forced to sort of change our approach to news. Um, and with our first, our first sort of our freelance budgets disappeared. Then we were asked to court viral web traffic and we had to 
aggregate a minimum of seven stories per day from other outlets. Um, and then eventually each editor was assigned two towns to cover instead of just one. And uh, I think sim similar to Mike again, you know, we had to cope with that workload. We had to sort of stop attending some meetings. We, had, we spent less time on the phone with sources. Um, and the quality of the reporting really did suffer and readers noticed. So, you know, I, th I think it is just important for, for people to understand that community reporting is time intensive and meetings can last six hours or more. There's, there's dead ends from tips and then the writing process itself takes quite a bit of time. So, you know, there, it is sort of essential that reporters aren't overtasked if they're going to do the type of impact journalism that matters. And I have to say, I miss the patch. <laughs> I, yeah. I followed it a lot. The first editor was had a lot of personality and we covered, listened to a lot of things, read about a lot of things. So, yeah, mm -hmm. miss that one a lot. Still, still exists today but in a different form. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, not the same. But let's talk a little bit about digital media. All three of you have mentioned it a little bit. Um, and we know that um, a lot of journalists that are working in these smaller local papers um, are have a demand for increased work workload, as you've all just said. Um, can you speak to the, the transition from print to digital and how that increase in content demands impacted your job? Um, I think Zach just talked about it a little bit, but... Um, how does that change a local paper when you have to keep up with things moment to moment um, on the web? Let's yeah. start this time with Margo. Well, um, my answer would be, uh, you know, pretty easy. Um, again, we don't get on that hamster wheel. <laughs> you know, we have a website because we have to have a website. You know, it's the basics that people expect, but we very seldom will do breaking news on the website and um, everything that you see on our website is either, well, not every everything, but um, a lot of it either was in the paper or will be in the paper. And uh, we just, we just don't, uh, we don't even try to go there. So I would defer to the other, other panelists. <laughs> I just think it's really interesting um, how you have, uh, um, told us stories about how how you've changed in ways that uh, have widened um, the coverage um, instead and and the perspectives of of that coverage. So um, it's obviously working for you. So I think that's just fascinating. It is, yeah. Okay, Zach, you just talked a little bit about it, but yeah. it is it possible for us to have a small staff and keep up with a website? I mean, I think actually like, somewhat similar to Margo, you know, at the Southwest Journal, we were upfront about the fact that our focus was on the print edition that came out every other week. Um, and we sort of took more of a magazine or explainer approach and didn't compete with other outlets. And I think that was just sort of, this is how we can uh, do the best job at sort of finding the most stories where we're the, ol where we're the only reporters in the room. And that, wor that worked for us. I mean, we also, we waited until after press and then we would post most of our stories online. And we ended up with more than a million page views a year online. So it wasn't insignificant and we would cover um, breaking news stories online. Uh, but you know, I think different news outlets and different types of news outlets will take different approaches. And, um, and especially sort of if you have a, a, a model that's been working for years or decades, you're probably gonna stick with that model for upstart organizations, um, they'll need to do something else. Um, you know, I also think, you know, when it comes to social media, that definitely adds a layer of complexity to our jobs that isn't necessarily all bad. Um, because sharing work on sites like Twitter and Facebook can be time consuming, especially for outlets that can't afford to hire online editors. But it's also a tool for journalists to communicate with readers, um, to see what readers are interested in, to attract new readers, and for us to find sources and find story ideas. Um, you know, of course, sites like Facebook and Google have also been devastating for newspapers' revenue streams, but, but that's, that's a different question. <laughs> so Mike, what was your experience with the online publication? Yeah, I can only really echo Margo and Zach here. Uh, it was never a focus because, you know, the print was always the bread and butter. It was the same, you know, everything goes to press. And then, you know, if that happens on Friday, on Monday, those, those stories are going up. Um, I guess I, yeah, I guess I'll just echo and, and leave it at that. Okay. You know, um, at, um, 
at Nine North, we had a regular news show that I produced for a number of years. And um, we did just what Margot said. We moved from um, news to magazine um, type of, of articles that we covered because we, there's no way we could be on top of everything that was happening. So we would go from 15 articles a week to three or four um, that were media interviews. So um, uh, people like to tune in and, and see that kind of stuff, I think. So, but something that you all just brought up, let's talk a little bit about financing for um, mm -hmm. two failed, failed newspapers, let's say historic memory newspapers and one that's still thriving. Um, what do you see um, for attempting to balance business pressures, raising the money uh, regarding revenue with journalistic responsibility? Um, what revenue models should you be considering uh, for local newspapers? And here's the big question, would a government funded option uh, work at all? Um, this time, let's start with Zach. Uh, yeah, I mean, so newspaper ad revenues have felt they fell by more than sixty percent across the country between two thousand eight and twenty eighteen. So it's it's not just the pandemic that's gutted the industry. And I really do think we need to be ambitious, and we need to put all ideas on the table. Um, there's a, a lot of sm small for profit papers like the Southwest Journal have taken to asking readers for donations or to sign up for voluntary subscriptions. So for, for people watching, you know, donating $10, $20 per month or more as you can afford it to support your local news outlet is definitely a huge piece of the puzzle. Um, as far as government funding goes, I think that's tricky. Uh, you know, journalists, we're, we're fearful of being financially reliant on those we cover um, and we cover government, um, but you know, it, it is, Hard to argue that this summer's PPP loans, that they weren't an experiment in government funding. The, the Southwest Journal got about $150,000, which really did help us survive for a while during the pandemic. And, you know, if the, the second round of support had passed um, Congress sooner, the paper may not have closed. So I do think these are questions to consider. Um, but, you know, I, th I, th I, th I think any public funding should be structured so that the government isn't picking sides or defining what constitutes a legitimate news outlet, and so that politicians can't easily halt funding to outlets this, they dislike. So if some, um, some people get government funding that don't necessarily deserve it, that's better than, um, than censorship, I think. And some proposals I've seen include subsidizing local news subscriptions, giving tax credits to employers who hire journalists, or directing government departments to buy ads and local news outlets. But you know, as journalists, it always feels a little bit tricky to be advocating um, specifically for any of these things. Uh, another problem that we should point out that needs solving is vulture capital hedge funds, buying up newspapers, gutting their reporting staffs, and harvesting the businesses for cash. Um, this is what Alden Global Capital has done in St. Paul to the Pioneer Press. It's pushed out about 80% of the news staff since buying the paper in 2007. Um, and then just this week, I was saddened to learn that Alden has agreed to buy the company that owns the Chicago Tribune, the Orlando Sentinel, and the New York Daily News. So, so it's, it's bleak days for the newspaper business in some respects, and we really do need to be trying everything. So, and in, in my mind, that means that local newspapers should be even more um, important, effective, and um, and be something that neighbors are looking for, right? If they aren't going to get that coverage anymore in the in the dailies. So, um, how about Mike? What what's your take on funding? I think for the small local paper, the kind of neighborhood funded, the donation funded, the nonprofit route is not being an expert in it. I, I feel like it's the most viable way to do things. I look at the Park Bugle, which is in uh, St. Anthony, St. Paul, St. Anthony. Uh, I'm, I'm losing the neighborhood name, but uh, you know, that neighborhood of St. Paul, it's in Lauderdale, it's in Falcon Heights. They're upfront about asking for donations. Um, I look at government funding just as essentially a non-starter for the sake of independence of the press. Um, it may sound a little frivolous, but I think of even, you know, angry callers to the newsroom, angry calls that I fielded 
you know, it's, it, it would be just one thing to have a caller saying, Hey man, I pay for what you do, you know, and then a whole other thing to have a angry public official, you know, breathing down your neck. So, um, there could be ways I think to do that. And I, I do like Zach's thought on the idea of, you know, if some people who maybe aren't on the straight and narrow, get some funding to do work, well, that means that, you know, the more the merrier, the more voices are being heard. Uh, though it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a fraught subject. I, I'd say the, the nonprofit is interesting. I have no idea how to make it work. <laughs> well, Margo, as somebody who is making it work still right now, what can you tell us? Yeah, well, I think that, um, you know, we, we put product first, um, but we watch our expenses and we have a lot of loyal advertisers for whom either it's working really well or or they're donating. I don't need to know. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I I don't think that they would be donating for year upon year upon year. You know, it must be working for them somehow. And so, you know, we have a good formula and we're we're trying not to mess with it. Um, but uh, when you mentioned you know, the possibility of government funding, um, I think that uh, there's a real good argument for advertising by units of government. Um, you know, back in the heyday of these papers, you know, I, I agree with what everyone else has said, you know, revenues are down um, from what they were in the late 90s, let's say. Um, we used to have space to remind people to put their garbage carts out or uh, features on what's recyclable and what's not, or, um, you know, leaf sweeping into the street, don't do it, you know, stuff like that. Um, we don't have that kind of space anymore, but if governments were to take out ads and deliver those public service messages, and if they were not any more than say 20% of our revenue, um, I don't think we'd feel controlled by them. Uh, you know, we would take them into consideration as we would any other advertiser. But um, if they were to drop because they didn't like how we were doing stuff, oh, well, you know, as long as you don't lose 20 percent <laughs> or have 20 percent tied up in any more, you know, any one customer or supplier, I guess, is the guideline. Um, you should be doing OK. You can weather that kind of thing. So yeah, they like and the utilities is another one, you know, XL Energy and um, Minigasco used to regularly advertise in small papers and now they are not. So uh, sounds like a workable model, though, for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. OK, let's look a little bit at um, you talked about uh, all three. You talked a little bit about covering government and um, how that affects um, your reporting. Um, I'm going to say um, we saw a recent scholarly article that a correlation was made that when there are fewer local reporters who cover issues, fewer candidates run for local office. Um, do you see this happening here in, in our cities, our local cities in Minnesota? And how does that lack of local coverage adversely affect civic engagement and, and um, you know, an electorate that's maybe educated about issues? Um, so I can't remember who we started with last time. Let's start with Zach this time. <laughs> sure. Um, well, well, one way is that, you know, as local news sites are dying, we're seeing fake news sites spring up uh, with generic names like West Twin Cities and South Pedipa News that are actually pay for play political propaganda. And this is a national phenomenon. You could read about it in the New York Times. So, so I think that's worrisome. Um, and, you know, you know, one role, that journalists serve is as stewards of a shared reality. We create a space where people can collectively debate ideas and grapple with facts and check what they read against what they see. Um, and you know, since the Southwest Journal is closed, I, I do worry that Southwest Minneapolis residents will get more of their information from echo chambers. I worry people will form more of their opinions based on unvetted speculation they see on Nextdoor, based on partisan rhetoric they read on Twitter, based on the unverified, often inaccurate reports. They read on Facebook pages that track crime via police radio chatter, which are growing in popularity across the metro. Um, you know, I think all this is a problem because ultimately it trickles up to our civic institutions, which are designed to mirror the public's collective beliefs. So 
we really do need local news and we can't have good civic engagement without good information flow. So Mike, what, what's been your experience with um, how covering local government impacts the electorate, the voting, and even um, the outcome of the elections? No, we, we would chat about you know, the idea that the lower information around an election, you know, opens the door for people with an ax to grind or people, you know, the, it just opens up the possibility that perennial candidates, not to necessarily denigrate them as a whole, but, you know, folks that want into local government for a very specific reason, a very personal specific reason, when there's not enough information out about who's doing what and who's who, you know, it opens the door for people to get in. And um, yeah, I just think it kind of, would it lower the quality? I don't know, but it lowers just the ability of people to engage. And uh, I know I, I covered Roseville politics and I watched, you know, the, the most recent election I drive in Roseville every now and then. And I know, uh, Longtime incumbent lost her seat, and uh, I meant to look and see if I could find maybe a Pioneer Press story about it, but I'm not sure if that's out there. And it must be bewildering if you live in Roseville and maybe are a very passive watcher of city politics, but still maybe want to know now and then what's going on. You know, I wonder if that story is out there. So um, there, there's a definite loss there. Yep, um, I totally agree, and I think. Um... I, not, none of you have mentioned, but letters to the editor, um, I think, are just key for a lot of people. A lot of people open to that page first, you know, just to see what's happening and what the reactions are. So, Margo, how about you? What do you think uh, about you and your local politics and, and <laughs> what kind of an impact you've had? Well, interesting. Uh, you should mention letters to the editor. Uh, we used to run an editorial every edition. Um, and, and sometimes it was real head scratcher to figure out a topic. Um, but lately, because space has been tight and we've been getting letters to the editor, I've actually foregone doing the editorial uh, a few times. And I don't know if it's if it's related, but we seem to be getting more letters to the editor. So maybe I should just shut up, you know. Um, but as far as impact on candidates, um, we have a pretty healthy um, system, I, I think, in Columbia Heights and St. Anthony. There have been um, multiple uh, candidates for positions, especially lately. And, and I think as first-ring suburbs, they've undergone a lot of soul-searching, and there are a lot of younger or you know, less tenured people in town um, wanting to be heard. And... Um, I, I'm not necessarily saying that the newspaper has helped them or hurt them, but they do seem to be active and they, they have their social media act together as well. And, um, and, you know, we, we do report on them. Um, and then in Northeast Minneapolis, um, there's a lot of progressive activity and, uh, longtime candidates, um, you know, potential for transition, uh, is the transition good or not? you know, hard to say. Um, but I don't think we have any dearth of, uh, of people figuring out politics, uh, whether we are participating in it or not, but we do, we, we do, um, articles when people announce, we do, uh, interviews, you know, in advance of the, the political, um, season. So I, I can see how important all of these subjects are for local readers um, and that they need to value that in order to make it keep happening, correct? Um, for us to close, I'd like to hear from each of you what you think about the future of local newspapers, um, if it's viable and um, if it's going to keep happening. Marco, let's start with you. I know you just <laughs> talked, but um, yours is keeping happening. And so I'm, yeah. I'm just wondering what you see for the future of your paper. I, I think it's it's a bright future. Um, you know, obviously I have gray hair, so I won't be at it forever, but um, I'm very dedicated to seeing to it that uh, somebody does come up behind me to take it on. And, um, you know, uh, I, I, I hope it, 
I hope it continues and, and I guess that's all I'll say. <laughs> so if someone else has a chance. <laughs> How about Zach? Tell us what you think what is going to happen for local newspapers. Yeah, I, I, well, there, there has been a huge growth in nonprofit newsrooms around the country in the last five to 10 years. Um, and they, they now employ about 2,300 journalists across the country. Um, and that, that's still a pretty small fraction of the overall industry. But I definitely see it as a bright spot. Um, it's an opportunity to improve the industry and better serve the BIPOC and low-income communities with the largest information needs and not just wealthy areas like Southwest Minneapolis that have big advertising bases and have traditionally been able to report, uh, to be, been able to support a, um, a high quality journalistic model. Um, the, the Sahan Journal is a nonprofit news site that covers the state's immigrant and refugee communities. It launched a couple of years ago. It's been very successful in attracting foundation money as well as donations from readers, um, which is where most nonprofit um, news sites funding comes from. And a number of their reporters come from a national service program called Report for America that shares the cost of placing reporters in newsrooms. Um, the Minnesota Reformer is another new nonprofit newsroom that's doing great work. Um, I also think that traditional small town print weeklies still have a lot of life in them um, and pa papers uh, like the Northeaster. And I think there are a lot of places that still are doing well. Um, and you know, both advertisers and readers still prefer print and people still want to read about what's happening at City Hall, in their schools, on their streets. So, so I think I think we need to experiment to find new funding models. Um, personally, I believe that in a healthy democracy, news has to be free for all. Um, the Star Tribune and the New York Times, they do great work. But if you want to read them both online, it'll cost you $400 a year, which is just not affordable to many, many residents of the state. I know the Strib is, is working to get subscriptions into schools right now, which is, which is a good start. Um, but you know, I, I don't know what the, the future of local news will be, but I know that if we fail to figure it out, it'll mean more conspiracies, more corruption, more misinformation. So I do hope that we take this problem seriously, um, and I hope we get it right, and we, that we get it right fast. And, and, and thank you for putting together this panel. Oh, well, you are welcome. Thank you all for being here. Mike, what do you see? You worked with a newspaper that was there for many decades. What do you see for a future for local newspapers? Uh, from personal experience, they're gonna have to change and you know rethink their models. If I knew much more than that, I'd maybe go start a newspaper right now. Uh, I do know I wanna say thanks to Margo for what she does because you know, invaluable when uh, my Minnesota House District had a primary with 13 people. I mean, the value's there. I think hopefully folks will realize it. Um, I don't know how much print we're gonna see necessarily. I think that, you know, the, the, the quickest and most efficient way is probably gonna be online, you know, with the Sahan Journals and Minnesota Reformers. But um, again, if I, if I knew or, you know, if more people knew, it, it would be a different state of things. Well, I think we've learned a lot about it here already tonight. Um, and it's so refreshing to talk to three real journalists who um, value not only the past uh, of journalism, but what's going to maybe happen in the future um, and, and taking responsibility for making sure that the public does get informed on all kinds of issues especially those local ones. And I have to say, I can't wait till I can get back in my coffee shop with my local paper and sit at that table and read that hard copy. I really, you know, I think that's a special process that that kind of speaks to me of what America is all about, if not, you know, anything else. So thank you, the three of you, for joining us tonight. And um, I want to make sure that everybody knows about this whole series um, of Compass programs, where we're looking at controversial topics that affect us locally um, and looking at ways that they're magnified by the pandemic, getting information out to people, just as we've talked about tonight, um, about how you affect your local communities. So thank you for joining us, all three of you, and we will see you for our next Compass program on Nine North.